Welcome everyone to this week's Final Brain and Mind seminar series. Before we get started, I would like to ask you to mute your microphones and to also turn off your video so that we ensure an optimal experience for the speaker and for the audience. Thank you. So this session is the continuation of the Final Brain Imaging Center lectures and the Cognition and Circuit seminar series. And it's co-organized by Bratislav Music, uh, Nathan Spreng and myself. And we get support from Sasha Kelly and Debbie Rashovsky from the Neuro Events team. So if you would like to give a talk or would like to propose a speaker, please get in touch with us and we'll try to schedule that person. So today it's my pleasure to introduce Thomas Funk, who um, did his PhD at the Neuro and the group of Alan Evans. And he's now about to begin a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Forschungszentrum Jülich in Germany, working in the group, in the group of Nicola Palomero Gallagher. And today he'll present work on mapping 3D receptor architecture in human brains, which combines post-mortem audio radiography as well as advanced image, image processing. So thanks, Thomas, for agreeing to give the talk, and I look forward to it. For the audience, please hold on with your questions, and we'll have a formal Q&A period at the end of the talk. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, let me know if you can't hear me or something. Um, okay, so before starting in the presentation in earnest, uh, I just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge sort of the, uh, the racial uh, injustice that we've seen in the United States uh, in this past week. Um, it's been very hard for a lot of us, I think, um, especially coming from Washington, D.C., seeing scenes of um, violence there. It's been very moving. Um, but as our uh, Prime Minister noted, uh, it's easy to sort of uh, uh, criticize the U.S., but uh, uh, racial inequality and inequity remains a problem in Canada and in Montreal. Um, so if you have um, any time or resources to spare, uh, these are two uh, really great organizations, I think, that do good work in Montreal. Uh, Hoodstock in, in particular seems uh, quite cool. So, uh, yeah, if you have time, I'm sure they would benefit from your help. Okay, on to the talk in earnest. Um, so this is going to be a talk uh, covering part of my PhD work, um, which involved creating an ultra-high-resolution 3D neuroreceptor atlas, um, but also looking at how we can bridge the gap uh, between autoradiography and PET. Uh, Thomas? Yep. Uh, I, I don't see your video. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, oh, my video? Uh, or I don't see your, your slides. Yeah, no. You see everything? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll just go back in case anybody wanted to take note of the organizations. Okay, um, so you can see everything? Yes, perfect, okay. thanks. Um, so, um, we uh, at the neuro especially we're very good about uh creating atlases but often we think of this in terms of morphological atlases and in terms of maybe morphological features like cortical thickness but it's actually uh, an interesting project to create um standardized atlases of receptor distribution both in normal and pathologic populations um and i mean this is just basically because as we all know uh chemo architecture sort of underpins um, all the information processing that's going on in the brain um, and there are two main imaging modalities that we can use to do this. One is autoradiography, which as many of you may know, um, produces very high resolution images, um, about 50 microns. Um, the downside, however, is that it's very, very expensive. Um, I think for a whole brain, it cost uh, 2 million euros back in 2002. Um, and it only produces uh, 2D images uh, for post-mortem brains. So there's some considerable limitations, especially if you want to do mapping on large population sets. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's PET imaging, which has the advantage of being uh, in vivo. And surprising to say, it's relatively inexpensive, although much more expensive perhaps than uh, MRI. Um, and so it's an interesting modality because it can indeed be used to acquire large data sets. Uh, so you can potentially create uh, a, a receptor atlas for uh, glutamate receptors in young adults, young healthy adults or something like that, which would be extremely difficult, if not impossible to do with autoradiography. Um, the downside, of course, is that PET has much lower spatial resolution. Indeed, it's not quite clear up to what resolution you can get with PET. Um, there are various algorithms you can use to uh, try and improve the resolution, but it's, it's not quite clear how well these work. Um, nonetheless, there's been really, really great work um, from uh, Gita Knudsen's lab in Copenhagen, 
where they have already published two uh, sets of receptor atlases uh, using PET, one for various serotonin receptors and then one for uh, GABA-A, I believe the benzodiazepine receptor. Um, so for the rest of my talk, I'm split into two parts. The first part will be uh, towards building um, a 3D receptor atlas based off of 2D autoradiography, so basically how we can reconstruct 2D images into 3D. Um, and then the second part, we'll be looking at how we can use these 3D atlases to inform um, or to uh, try to evaluate the uh, effective spatial resolution of PET using simulation. Um, okay, oops. Um, so to describe the data a bit for you guys, um, there were three brains that were acquired. They were acquired fresh, um, and they were subsectioned into slabs that you can see here. Um, and then the slabs were uh, shock frozen um, and then sliced with a microtome. Uh, the sections are then uh, sort of stained or in a solution containing a radioligand uh, that binds to a particular receptor. Um, the labeled sections are then exposed to beta sensitive film, which produces the autoradiographs that you'll see later. Uh, these images have a 20 micron pixel size, but the actual effective resolution is more like 50 microns. Uh, from the raw autoradiographs, which are basically just grayscale images, um, we can create images of actual receptor binding um, based on, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, on the upper left-hand image, there's these little boxes. So using these calibration uh, cubes, uh, we can come up with a, a good uh, estimate of actual binding density. Um, so the data consists of three post-mortem human brains. Uh, which were each visualized for 20 different receptor binding sites using uh, autoradiography. Uh, so it's very important to emphasize that these uh, data are acquired sequentially. So that means that, for example, let's say you have a first section which is for uh, dopamine, let's say, a dopamine receptor. You have to go through 19 other sections before you get back to the same kind of dopamine uh, section. So that means that there is that minimum, although often more, a 400 micron gap between any particular sections for a particular receptor. Um, and these data were collected by uh, uh, Carl Zillis, who very sadly uh, passed away a few weeks ago, and uh, Nicola Palomero Gallagher, who is now my uh, postdoctoral supervisor and sort of has taken up the mantle of the receptor group in Eulish. So this is what the data actually look like, just to sort of give you an idea. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of variability. Um, and these data cover Four, uh, no, several different neurotransmitter families, including uh, glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, serotonin, and some dopamine. Um, so quite the gamut. Now in reconstructing these 2D images into 3D, so there are a lot of challenges that we had to overcome. Um, the first of which is obviously just the fact that there's very different binding intensities between different receptors and different regions of the brain. So as you can see here, uh, it's not quite clear how easily one would be able to align these two different images. Um, another uh, important problem is that because these brains had to be acquired fresh, they weren't fixed, um, there's a lot of deformation in the brains. Um, on top of that, the slabs that were cut uh, from each brain that I mentioned earlier, uh, they're not cut perfectly parallel to each other. So essentially, they all have their own sort of axis for, of slicing. Um, and this means that sort of each slab has to be sort of treated on its own before being put back together. So you have to reconstruct the slabs before you can put them back together in 3D, all of them together in 3D. Uh, there's also a lot of missing or um, incomplete sections. Um, so we have, for example, the hemisphere that I'm going to be reconstructing and showing you guys here, we only have about 2,000 out of like 7,500 slices. And on top of that, a lot of the slices are at the ends of slabs um, where, well, sorry, a lot of the slices at the end of slabs are incomplete. Um, so that uh, compounds the difficulties. Uh, finally, uh, what's caused a lot of headache is that um, the, uh, there's a lot of variability in how these autoradiographs were actually acquired. So in some of them, you have this sort of arrow artifact that you see in the top left. Some of them, you have these bounding boxes. Uh, on the bottom left one, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Uh, Boris, could you let me know if you can see my mouse? Otherwise, yeah, I, don't yeah, I can okay. see it. it yeah, so here there's some like smudging, uh, which can create problems. Um, here there's a, a hot background. Um, and so what all this kind of combines to do is that it makes it hard to come up with like a one size fits all uh, pipeline to, uh, to process all of these. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot of challenges that had to be overcome. Uh, 
Um, to do that, I created uh, this processing pipeline that I'll walk you through step by step um, in order to finally reconstruct all of the, or to potentially reconstruct all the receptors at high resolution into, onto the subject's uh, MRI. So we start out with the autoradiographs and the MRI, and the first step is to pre-process the uh, autoradiographs. Um, this is done, first I trained uh, a unit to automatically detect the lines um, in, uh, or the bounding boxes in the raw images. Um, the bounding boxes could then be removed. Um, and then I used some sort of standard computer vision techniques to identify the target piece of tissue in any um, autoradiograph and then uh, crop it by removing uh, background images. So once all of the images have been pre-processed in this way, um, they're then ready to be aligned to one another. So what this means is that we align the autoradiographs to their adjacent neighbors, uh, to their neighbor closest to the center of the slab from which they were acquired. Um, and so what this means is not that you're aligning necessarily like a dopamine slice with the next o dopamine slice over. It means it could be like dopamine to serotonin, serotonin to GABA, GABA to whatever. Um, so if you take all of the autoradiographs and just sort of like stack them on top of each other after pre-processing, but before alignment, it looks like what you see at iteration zero. Um, so that is to say, it doesn't look like very much. Um, but then by aligning the autoradiographs to their neighbors, um, sort of iteratively, uh, you can eventually come up with an initial reconstruction that you see here, and it, there's some fine tuning that happens over subsequent iterations. So this is done for each slab. So that means that for each slab now, we have reconstructed, uh, have an initial reconstruction of receptor volumes that contain all of the receptors together. The next step is to try to align the receptor volumes, each re receptor volume from each slab, to the donor's MRI. Uh, but this poses a first problem, that is that the images just look very different. This is very much an apples to oranges comparison uh, between the receptor volume and the MRI. Um, not only is there uh, a lot of missing sections in the receptor volume that you can see, there's also uh, just differences in intensities, which creates like weird patterns in the receptor volume. Um, and also the receptor volume is uh, non-linearly warped relative to the MRI. Um, so to make this task a little bit easier, what I did is I extracted a gray matter mask from the MRI and from the receptor volume. For the receptor volume, uh, I did something very simple uh, that worked, more or less, um, which is just on each section, just use k-means classification for each autoradiograph. So the k-means is initialized with uh, three classes or three values. Uh, one image max to get the gray matter values, uh, the mean of non-zero voxels to get the white matter or non-specific binding, and um, then the background to just uh, yeah, set to zero to get all the background. Um, so this works very well for receptors with high contrast, like you see on the top. Um, and even when it doesn't work very well, it still works like, okay, like good enough. Um, now, there are definitely better, more sophisticated ways to do this. And that's something I'd be very happy to talk about later and something that's kind of ongoing. Um, so what we get then from the receptor volume is this uh, gray matter receptor mask. Um, as you can see, it's not perfect. And um, there's uh, definitely ways that this could be improved. Um, but it's good enough to start aligning to the MRI volume. From the MRI, the way we extracted the gray matter mask was to supersample the space between the inner and outer cortical surface mesh. Um, so what this allows you to do basically is create um, a very high resolution, in this case, a 250 uh, micron resolution cortical gray matter mask. Um, and then for the subcortex, we just uh, use the animal segmentation superimposed on top of the uh, cortical segmentation. Oops. Um, okay, so now that was one problem for aligning the slabs to the MRI. Another problem is which slab goes where, because there might be like a tiny bit of space between the slabs, so you can't just sort of like stack them on top of each other. If you were to do that, going from front to back, you wouldn't end up at the back of the brain with the last slab. So we need a way to find out exactly which slab goes where and with what orientation. So to do this, um, I adapted a pre-existing method um, where basically you take the slab volume and align it as best as you can to the MRI, and then you move it over in the coronal axis by a, a few millimeters, and then calculate the correlation, sorry, the first step you calculate the correlation, move it, calculate the correlation again, like so. So each time you're doing an affine registration of the uh, receptor volume to the uh, MRI mask. And each time you calculate the correlation, 
and presumably it goes down when the fit is less good. So eventually you can say, okay, at the location where there's the best fit between the uh, receptor volume and the MRI mask, that's where we're gonna place the slab volume on the MRI. So we can repeat this for the slab, next slab at the back of the brain, and then so on, until eventually you fit all of the slabs into the right position. So this is just a toy example, just to sort of illustrate it. There are more slabs um, in real life and the correlation values don't necessarily look quite so neat. Um, but then what this allows you to do finally is to map each um, re initially reconstructed uh, receptor volume back onto the donor's MRI, which you can see here. Um, and so even with affine transformation, it's not actually too, too bad, at least in some locations, like here, the, the caudate looks pretty good. Uh, this sulcus looks good. On the other hand, there's definitely spaces where it uh, could be improved. Um, right, so now that we have uh, an initial affine transformation between the receptor volume to the MRI, we can now start to use uh, a nonlinear transformation to correct for the deformations that I mentioned earlier, the 3D deformations uh, in the receptor volume that are due to the fact that the brains were extracted fresh um, and also potentially due to like slicing artifacts. Um, and so the way we did this is just with ANTS uh, SYN. Um, it's important to note that uh, the actual alignment was done at lower resolution than this. So a lot of the lack of smoothness that you see here is sort of uh, removed by the, the smoothing. On the other hand, that means that the registration isn't yet as accurate as it maybe could be in the future. Um, so what you get then is uh, the, you see in gray, the warped MRI gray matter mask, and then in red, the receptor volume gray matter mask. And you can see the alignment between the two. Um, so it's important to note here is that whereas when we were doing the affine transformation, uh, we transformed the uh, receptor volume onto the MRI mask, here we're doing the opposite. We're um, transforming the MRI mask, the MRI gray matter mask into receptor space. And the reason to do this is so that once these two are lined up in receptor space, that means that for every autoradiograph you have, you have a, every coronal autoradiograph section you have in the receptor volume, you have a corresponding coronal section in the MRI, which will be important um, at a later state. Okay, so now we have our warped MRI gray matter mask in receptor space in autoradiograph graph space, so to speak. Um, okay, so everything I presented so far has included all of the autoradiographs graphs together. However, eventually what we would like to have is one reconstructed volume for each different receptor. So one dopamine volume, uh, one serotonin volume, or two serotonin volumes for each receptor that we have. Uh, yeah. And so the, the next step is to come up with a way to uh, basically fill in the missing sections between uh, autoradiographs graphs that were acquired for a particular receptor. So in this case, we're going to be looking at benzodiazepine. So if we have benzodiazepine, how do we fill in the missing benzodiazepine receptors? Or uh, filling, sorry, fill in the missing benzodiazepine autoradiographs. graphs. Oops. Um, okay, so this, this is going to take a second to explain, uh, but hopefully it'll make sense. Um, so if you recall it before, I just said that we ha once we have warped the MRI into receptor space, that means that for each coronal section in the MRI, we potentially have a coronal section in the receptor volume. So that is sort of what is depicted here. Here you have the receptor volume for benzodiazepine, say. So here you'd have an autoradiograph of benzodiazepine. This is a coronal section. Another coronal section here for benzodiazepine. And what we're trying to do is fill in the missing gaps here. Uh, we do that using the MRI. Um, so the idea is to warp these uh, autoradiographs to the position where uh, a uh, a benzodiazepine autoradiograph is missing, taking into account the morphological changes that happen in the MRI between these two locations. Or yeah, maybe. Um, so first, uh, you take the uh, autoradiograph here and warp it using a 2D nonlinear transformation to the corresponding MRI section, corresponding uh, coronal section in the MRI. And then you warp the MRI to itself. So you warp the MRI from here to here. So that takes into account the morphological changes that happen in the brain between these two positions, these two coronal positions. Um, and then you do the same thing for the anterior, uh, let's say this is anterior, uh, benzodiazepine autoradiograph. So you warp it in 2D from here to here, um, and then in 2D, the MRI to itself from here to here. What that then lets you do is uh, 
transform this iterator graph so it resembles the morphology here, the gross morphology here. Um, and the same thing uh, for this iterator graph. You transform it by concatenating these two transformations so that it matches the morphology of the brain here. Um, and then we just do a simple um, linear distance weighted interpolation between the two. Um, now, it might be tempting at this point to think about like trying to do a more sophisticated form of interpolation, a higher order interpolation. Um, when I tried that, however, the problem is that if you go too far away from the, the next iterator graphs over contain very little pertinent information. And so it didn't seem to work very well. So for example, doing a cubic or, or whatever, some more fancy spline didn't seem to work very well. Um, and so the result of this is a reconstructed uh, benzodiazepine volume or GABA-A benzodiazepine volume that you see here. Uh, the green lines is where we actually have an autoradio graph. And basically what you see in between is the reconstruction or the interpolation. Um, so there's definitely points where the, there's flaws just in the data that you can see here potentially. Um, but overall, it seems to work fairly well where there is a preservation of, um, of laminar structure that you can observe. Um, now, I just want to get into a little mythological question uh, before continuing, which is that this method does have an important flaw. Um, and that's the fact that if you section the brain tangentially to the surface of the cortex, um, what you're going to do is sort of have a misrepresentation of the laminar distribution in the cortex. So if you imagine that we're trying to interpolate this middle uh, section here based on the left and right sections, um, the left and right sections um, here, they cut through uh, the brain tangentially to the surface, more or less, um, as opposed to like this. Um, and so what could potentially happen is if you use the interpolation method I described, um, is that you average densities from one layer with, den with densities from another layer for this midpoint, and that may not be accurate at all. Um, so this is definitely a limitation. And um, again, uh, we've thought of, of some ways to get around this, but uh, it's not implemented yet. But we'd happy to, I'd be happy to discuss it later. To sort of um, test this though, um, <clears throat> we did a, a very simple simulation. I say we, it was uh, Conrad Waxtill and I. So he provided me with a um, equivolumetric segmentation of the donor brain. So that's what you see here, the ground truth. So these are just sort of like imaginary values that sort of have a laminar distribution. Now, if we assume that the brain has this sort of laminar distribution, and then we apply the interpolation method, given the benzodiazepine sections that we have, to the ground truth, what do we get? And that's the interpolated volume that you see here. And um, so there's definitely uh, errors that one can spot. Um, but overall, it seems to more or less preserve the, um, the laminar distribution somewhat well. Um, and then you can see an error volume here. Uh, but we can also look at the error values a bit more quantitatively. Um, and so here on the y-axis, we have coronal sections through this uh, slab of tissue. Uh, where you have the troughs here, that's basically where we have an actually acquired uh, autoradiograph. So the error is basically one or, or zero in this case. Um, and um, so we see that the error is generally between one to maybe like five or six percent. So it's generally pretty good, but it goes very high when there are large gaps between acquired autoradiographs, graphs, as you can see here. Um, so this method that I've described is definitely very sensitive to uh, gaps in the acquired autoradiographs. graphs. Um, okay, so that brings us uh, almost to the end of the pipeline. The last step, once we've um, uh, sort of filled in the missing sections for each uh, slab for a particular receptor type. Um, we can then transform all of these individual slabs back into or transform it into the space of the donor's MRI in MNI space. Um, and that's what you see here for slab one. Um, so <clears throat> uh, you can see it's, there's quite a nice correspondence uh, at the cortex, at least for this slab. Um, although there are definitely some places where there's improvements to be made. Um, and then here you see it for uh, all six slabs throughout the brain. Um, and you can see here that there are potentially some large gaps between the slabs. Um, this could also be just the large gaps you see here could also be uh, because of the affine transformation somehow didn't stretch the slab enough um, in the coronal direction. And so here I have a GIF that's not going to show up on my PDF, 
and for which I'm quickly going to transfer over to this. Uh, no. To. Sorry, bear with me for a second. Uh, Ah, uh, there we go. Okay, so now you should all see the web browser with the four GIFs. So this is a reconstruction, not just for the benzodiazepine volume, which is on the far left, uh, but also for the uh, GABA-A agonist, GABA-B, and GABA-A antagonist receptors. And so this is just to show that the, the pipeline works for uh, many different receptors, not just the benzodiazepine one. Um, that being said, um, these receptors all have high contrast, and so it remains to be seen how well it works for uh, receptors with very low contrast or with maybe very uneven distributions in density. Um, okay, so I'll then go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. No, we can okay. see the Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay. Did you see that? I just saw. I switched the slide. Now we see future perspectives. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so um, there's still much work to be done uh, for all this. Um, and uh, that's sort of what I'm doing in my postdoc. Um, so as I mentioned before, the, the K-means cortical segmentation is, is quite crude. So uh, Conrad and I have started working on um, a, a deep learning approach to doing cortical segmentation, both for histology and receptor data together. Um, which seems kind of pie in the sky, but um, so far we had actually some pretty promising results, so hopefully that will work out. Um, there are also ways to improve sort of the robustness and the smoothness of the initial alignment of the autorator graphs, um, as well as using a sort of geodesic interpolation scheme to fill the missing section or interpolate the missing sections between acquired autorator graphs. Um, another sort of uh, uh, big issue to tackle that uh, Alan likes to talk about a lot is the, the problem of aligning all this to the big brain. Um, because essentially you're doing intersubject, intermodal uh, alignment. Um, and so there's a lot of like technical problems as well as interesting uh, sort of biological problems to, to solve in doing this. Um, we hope there also will be some interesting like future perspectives for this sort of atlas. Uh, for one, it would be cool to extend the work of uh, Carl and, and Nicola on 2D receptor fingerprints into 3D. Um, we could also look at uh, receptor gradients throughout the brain, um, as well as uh, correlate receptor density with uh, gene expression, perhaps. Um, there could also be interesting work to be done uh, by looking at the targets of deep brain stimulation in terms of which uh, which receptor systems are stimulated by a particular uh, probe. Um, as well as in the uh, highball project, I think uh, an interesting aim is to do computational modeling based off of the uh, receptor densities. So I think the idea is to sort of calibrate uh, neuronal dynamics uh, based off receptor density, um, which is quite cool. Okay. Um, now I'm going to talk briefly about sort of an application of all of this that uh, was also part of my PhD, um, because so far we were looking at uh, receptor mapping with autoradiography, but you can also do receptor mapping in PET. And as I mentioned before, there are distinct uh, advantages to doing it with PET. Um, so just to make sure we're all clear on the problem, the problem of PET resolution is that if you take these two images, which have very similar uh, intensities, um, it's not clear if they actually came from the same brain. And in this particular case, they didn't. Uh, one brain has a uh, thinner cortex, but with uh, higher activity. Um, but because of the point spread function of the scanner, um, that gets obscured. And so if you were just to average these two brains into an atlas, you'd have sort of like a biased underestimate of the actual intensity values in, that partic in this particular region of the cortex. And so this is something important that, to keep in mind when uh, creating receptor atlases with PET. Um, so previous approaches to sort of quantify the effective spatial resolution of PET used, used simulations 
pad simulations where they defined uh, sort of a ground truth with large homogeneous regions, as you can see here. So it's not a brain, but it sort of illustrates the example. And then you pass it through a pet simulator and you get something like you see here. Um, or uh, Antonin Rayak did the same thing at the MNI uh, 15 years ago now. Um, and these approaches are interesting and have their merits, um, but they can never really capture the actual receptor density distribute, the, the, the scale at which receptor density is changed in the human brain. Um, and for that, you really need the kind of uh, data that we've just now succeeded in reconstructing. Um, so the idea of this part of the project was to use the, the benzodiazepine app um, as a ground truth for PET simulation. So the idea is you take the, the, pet, the uh, benzodiazepine volume, uh, plug it into um, the PET simulator, and then it gives you a realistic simulated PET image out as an output. Um, and so just if anybody's not familiar with the idea of a PET simulator, the idea is that um, it basically performs a digital PET scan that models most of the physics involved in a real PET acquisition. So it's very realistic, it's very slow, but it, it does capture a lot of the features of, um, of a real PET image. Uh, and then the scanner we modeled is the ECAT HRT, which uh, is one of the scanners that we have at the MNI. Um, so this is sort of the result of the simulation. So on the left, you see um, a coronal section from the input volume. And then on the right, you see um, a, re, uh, a form of reconstruction of what you get from the PET simulator. Um, so on the right, this is sort of the theoretical maximum resolution you could get with PET. Um, this is sort of like a, a perfect reconstruction. In practice, you would never be able to accomplish this, but it sort of represents like the asymptotic potential to which um, uh, pet reconstruction could get to or could uh, um, seek. Um, so with this simulated pet image, what's, interested, what's interesting is that you do see some of the same uh, laminar distributions that you see in the ground truth image. Um, right. And so it suggests that um, PET, in principle, um, can actually be used to uh, measure a signal that is sensitive to changes in laminar distribution. To look at this a little bit more quantitatively, um, I calculated the, cross, the local cross correlation between the two images. So local, local cross correlation just means that you kind of like slide a small window over the image and wherever the window is, you calculate the, the correlation between the two spots in the window and the two images. So yeah, like that. Um, and then what that produces is what you see here. Overall, if you average over all the, the cross correlation between in the windows between the two images, you get a correlation of 0.71, which seems uh, quite good. Um, but I think what's more interesting is that it's highly variable. Um, and in a way that I think is quite interesting. Specifically, you have much lower correlation in the sulcal depth, like you can see like here, here, here. Um, and actually this makes a lot of sense because um, if you think about it, if you have two different receptor distributions that are abutting each other on two sulcal walls, um, then the point spread function of the scanner is gonna make it so that these um, cross contaminate a lot, lot more um, than uh, cortex, which uh, doesn't suffer from as much uh, con cross contamination. Um, and so it suggests that the effect of spatial resolution of PET is highly variable and is based uh, significantly on uh, morphology. Um, so, and eventually, yeah, okay, that's all I'll say for now. Um, so the future perspectives for this, um, so I think this could be a really useful framework to assess the maximum resolution of PET, where people from different groups could take different receptor atlases, put it into a simulation that matches sort of like their acquisition parameters at, in their center, um, and then create a custom simulated PET image that they could then use to assess how accurately they could measure from their region of interest. So let's say you're interested in, um, GABA receptor distribution in the amygdala or uh, some glutamate receptor distribution in a subdivision of a motor area. Uh, this could sort of tell you um, how accurately you could hope to measure from that region for that receptor. And this could also be very useful for validating partial line correction algorithms, which can enhance uh, spatial resolution as well as reconstruction and scatter slash attenuation correction algorithms. Um, and what's really cool is that um, there's a new generation of PET scanners that are on the way. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the MNI has already ordered one, but I might be wrong. Um, but these can actually go to 1.2 millimeters for width half maximum. So in contrast, the HRT has a 2.5 millimeter uh, spatial resolution native. Um, and 
so what that means is that if you combine, let's say, 1.2 millimeter spatial resolution plus partial volume correction, you could maybe get down to below one millimeter resolution with PET, um, which maybe this is sci-fi, but maybe it's worth thinking about. Um, you could get some form of laminar PET. Um, now, is, is it going to be as high resolution as like high field fMRI uh, laminar, uh, laminar high field fMRI? Uh, probably not. Um, but I think it is none, nonetheless an interesting um, perspective to, uh, to investigate further and to see if it's actually possible. And I think this sort of simulation framework can help answer those questions. Um, finally, uh, to conclude, uh, so I described the reconstruction of a 3D receptor atlas. Uh, this was sort of like a proof of principle for uh, the pipeline that I've developed that shows that in principle we can reconstruct these uh, autoradiographs uh, to 50 microns in, uh, in MNI space. Um, and then eventually we'd like to extend this to the three brains, uh, two hemispheres, 20 receptors. So that's kind of what I'm working on now. Um, and then I described a way for doing realistic PET simulation that is based on gold standard receptor distributions, and that can be used to evaluate the maximum effective spatial resolution of PET, as well as validate resolution enhancement and quantification algorithms for PET. Um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, my two PhD supervisors, uh, Alexander Thiel at the Jewish General Hospital and uh, Alan Evans at the MNI, uh, as well as the invaluable help of Claude Lepage, uh, paul Joan Toussaint, uh, Mona Omid, um, and, uh, of course, our collaborators, um, Carl Zillis and Nicola Palmero Gallagher. Oh, and I should, I'm sorry, uh, apologies to Conrad Waxtill. He should uh, definitely be on here. Uh, so apologies to him, but yeah. So uh, that's it. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was terrific. And it's really laborious and advanced work. So it's great to see um, the progress. So we have time for questions. So you can ask questions either through the chat box or um, put your video back on and ask them directly to Thomas. In the meantime, we have some questions perhaps. So one, one thing that I may have at the beginning of your talk is how did you normalize intensities of the different slices or was there any need to, to normalize the intensities of um, the uh, receptor staining? Yeah, no, there's no, there's no normal. Well, so there is some normalization. I think that's done for like shading sort of uh, artifacts. That's done before uh, I ever get the receptors. And um, that's, I think, in the initial pre-processing, just producing the autoradiographs. Um, but otherwise, no, I don't think there's any need to just because of the quantitative nature of uh, receptor autoradiography. So it really measures like in... Uh, uh, femtomoles per protein or something like milligram protein, uh, the receptor density. Okay, cool. Um, it, it's just because you, you showed a few cuts and they, they always looked slightly different at the very beginning when you had the, in the background at least. So, uh, yeah, they just, the you mean, sorry, these ones? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, perhaps. Yeah, maybe those, yes. Um, yeah, so no, these don't need to be normalized. This is just, there's more density of some receptors than others. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, the next question was when you had like the interpolation being done to interpolate between the adjacent mm -hmm. slices. Well, that's maybe more like of a, because I'm like not really an expert in this, but that's maybe more of a question of some strategies that you could do because here you, you take advantage of shape changes from one slice to the next as measured by MRI. Could some other features also be possible that you, for example, get from different MRI contrasts or from MRI intensities directly? Um, yes, I think so. So if you have, uh, if you have MRI contrast that could give you some kind of like laminar distribution, which I think is possible, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in this. Um, but if you had that, then that would be very helpful. Um, unfortunately, I think um, we have the MRI that we have and uh, we're not gonna be able to acquire another one. Um, but in the future, yeah, that would definitely be helpful. Because yeah, essentially you wanna know how the, la the layers change. On the other hand, uh, sort of a limitation of that approach is that the receptor laminar l layers don't match the histology. Um, 
they're, they can be in, somewhat independent. Um, so yeah, there's that limitation. Thanks. So there's a question from uh, Casey. So I'll read the question to you. Are there certain areas of the cortex that are consistently difficult to map from the autoradiographs to, to the MRI, like extreme curvature of the mesial temporal lobe? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? So whether there oh, yeah. are certain areas of the brain that are difficult to map from, from autoradiographs to MRI, like for example, the mesial temporal lobe, hippocampus and adjacent structures. Uh, hmm. I... Yeah, uh, I, I don't know yet, so it's very possible. Um, I haven't gone through the alignment region by region um, uh, in order to determine this, but I, I imagine that could be the case. Um, and especially I think that region could be problematic because actually the, I think the civet surfaces maybe not work that well for those particular regions. Um, and so the gray matter mask that I'm using from the MRI may not be very good. Um, so yeah, for those regions, that could definitely be an issue. Um, but uh, I, I can't answer definitively yet. So are there some further questions? Uh, Thomas? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great, great work. Um, so uh, let me see if I can start my video again. Oh, probably not. It's fine. Doesn't matter. You hear me. So, <laughs> yeah. no, this is glib. <laughs> so uh, I was actually wondering, like, th this, this, is, this is definitely a great uh, way to measure the resolution of PET or basically just general uh, idea of understanding what we actually see in PET scans, right, with that resolution by going from like super high resolution into, into that domain. And I was wondering, it's a bit of a kind of also a bit of a um, sci-fi type of uh, question as well, but maybe uh, since you mentioned um, the work with uh, Conrad Waxtill, uh, I, I was wondering how much uh, you can inform, like for example, going the opposite way, you, you have a PET image and then you also have the, this very high resolution laminar distribution um, anatomical information from the big brain. And uh, having these two, two pieces of information together, can you somehow simulate what you see in auto radi radiographs? Uh, I know it's a bit, it's probably there are a lot of other missing uh, components, um, so missing variables in, there. In, yeah. in a certain sense, uh, we may, well, it's a bit tough to say. Um, that might be a useful approach, even even just to evaluate the accuracy of the interpolation technique, whatever in it, uh, interpolation technique we end up using. Um, because if we have relatively large gaps, maybe we could see like a boundary in PET that happens in a gap. Um, and in that case, it, it could be helpful. Um, and it can also be used sort of like um, as a sanity test for the reconstruction and the interpolation. Um, like if you get a, if you have, if you see one GABA receptor gradient in across the cortex in PET, you see a different one in autoradiography uh, in the reconstruction, um, then maybe we need to look more carefully at what we're doing in reconstruction. Maybe there's some sort of like bug along the way that's created this. Um, uh, so yeah, that's definitely uh, an interesting, but very challenging um, uh, approach. Right. Okay. I guess when we get to this point of uh, a laminar pet, uh, maybe it's a little bit more realistic. To oh yeah, that's, that. that's true. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's okay. Thank you. So yeah, thanks. There's like one more question from Alexei. Alexei, do you yeah. want to ask the question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. First of all, great work. Um, sorry if I missed your explanation, but how do you ensure uh, binding selectivity and specific specificity of different ligands uh, that you used in autoradiography? Uh, um, and how do you account for difference in binding affinity of different ligands? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think for the question of uh, selectivity and specificity, um, that's a question that I see Nicola is here, and she could probably answer better than I can. Um, but um, I think these have been validated against um, uh, blocking studies um, and based off of the, the change in binding based off of 
blocking of certain receptors, you can have uh, a measure of the uh, selectivity and specificity. Um, also, I think uh, there's a second part. Uh, Different, how do you account for the difference in binding activity affinity, uh, binding, binding uh, between the different receptors? So we, we do also have non-specific binding images, um, which uh, have not been used yet, but could would should be used for the simulation. Um, so I think those could show you uh, which tracers and which regions have uh, a lower amount of uh, non-specific binding. All right, thank you. But I see Nicola is just uh... oh. I don't know if Nicola wanted to jump in or if she was uh, satisfied with my <laughs> with my answer. You did well, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. So if there are no further questions, um, then we'll close the session. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this great talk, and um, it was really interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, feel free to email me questions or whatever if you uh, have any. <laughs>